Life isn't easy for many South Korean workers. We have some of the longest working hours among the developed world, a phenomenon this government is trying to change. Now, in 2018, this Moon Jae-in administration passed a law cutting the maximum working hours from 68 per week to 52. Even with the shorter working hours, kwarosa, a Korean term for death by overwork, is under the spotlight again. This after more than a dozen South Korean delivery workers died last year, allegedly from harsh working conditions. It's 5.30 in the morning. Most of the country is still asleep, but this logistic site in Puchon City near Seoul is already full of life. Here the grueling work has begun. Delivery drivers start the day sorting out parcels that come in different sizes and shapes. They need to pick out packages with addresses in their districts. The sun comes up and the work continues. Kondusan has been doing this for about 10 years now. After about three hours packing the parcels, finally he's off to start making deliveries. Delivery workers like him get paid by the number of packages they deliver. The hours he spent on sorting parcels are what he calls free labor. He earns an average of about 60 US cents for every parcel he delivers. Time is precious for South Korea's delivery worker. Logistic companies competing for business promise customers bullet speed deliveries. Delivery workers have to pay penalties if deliveries are late or lost. Now this van is packed with packages that the delivery driver will have to deliver during this morning within about three to four hours. He's off making his rounds at this building, which has no elevators. Going up and down the stairs is not difficult when packages are small. But the delivery man says many times they're big and bulky, as South Koreans are ordering everything online these days, from essential foodstuff to bottles of water and more. Soon he's off to make more deliveries around this apartment complex. I tagged along. And you'd think it'd be easier with the elevators, but Kwon Doo-san says that's not always the case. I am following Mr. Kwon to find out what life is like as a South Korean delivery worker. There's been lots of attention on their working conditions, especially after a spike in death related to overwork among delivery workers. Demand for delivery goods like this usually rises about 10 percent, but because of the COVID-19, that has nearly doubled last year. And that's why there's more pressure on delivery drivers like him to do this as quickly as they can. The global pandemic has pushed consumers around the world to make their purchases online, boosting demand for delivery services. In South Korea, some studies estimate that about 3.5 billion parcels have been delivered in 2020, up 30 percent from a year ago. It's nearly noon, and Kwon Doo-san has just finished his morning deliveries. He's trying to finish his lunch as fast as he can because he has to go back to the depot to pick up more packages for the afternoon. He says he skips lunch sometimes when the schedule is too tight. The father of two daughters says the workload wasn't like this before the COVID-19 pandemic. Most deliveries in South Korea are handled by large logistics companies. 
The logistics companies usually outsource the work through independent agents or middlemen to delivery workers like Juan Dusan, who are considered subcontractors working on commission using their own vehicles in assigned areas. And that's why they're not protected by the country's labor law, which sets the maximum working hours at 52. Mr. Kwan says his family has become very concerned about his health recently. According to the state-run Korea Occupation Safety and Health Agency, about one to four delivery workers died every year between 2015 and 2019. But in the first half of 2020, nine workers died, and several more in the second half. 작년에 이제 과로사로 돌아가신 분이 이제 열여섯 분이 계시고 심리적인 부분들의 영향을 되게 많이 받죠. 아 이러다가 나도 혹시 뭐 과로사 이게 나한테도 오는 일이 아닌가? The death sparked public outcry on logistics companies' relentless push to shorten delivery time as they fight to win over demanding customers. South Koreans are shocked by the death of more than a dozen delivery workers last year, allegedly due to quarosa or death from overwork. And some have begun to reflect on the demanding requests they put on delivery workers. The practice by logistics companies to compete for business at any costs have also come under greater scrutiny. The parents still can't believe their son Chang Dok Jun is dead. He died from respiratory problems at home on October 12, 2020, while having a shower after he returned home from doing overnight shift at Coupang, an up-and-coming online retailer. A company known for promising customers their deliveries will arrive before breakfast by 7 a.m. as long as they place their orders before midnight. Now, according to the parents, their son, Chang Dok Jun, was very healthy before he started working for this company. There, he lost about 15 kilograms while doing night shifts for about 18 months. He worked at Kupang's distribution center near his home in Tegu in the southern province of Gyeongsang. His mother says she wished she had forced him to quit. At first, they blamed themselves for their son's death. But official documents from the state-run Korea Workers' Compensation and Welfare Services later acknowledged that Chang's death was work-related. Kupang offered his condolences days after he died, saying they were sad to hear about the death of the worker. But it denied that the young man was overworked. In a statement posted on his website, the company said, like all delivery men, everyone at the distribution centers work a 52-hour week. The company said even its part-time workers can't work more than 52 hours and that Chang Dok Jun had worked 44 hours per week for three months on average. But Chang's parents disputed the statement. They say, citing documents from the Korea Workers' Compensation and Welfare Services, their son worked slightly more than 62 hours during the last week before his death. Kupang turned down CNA's request for comments, referring any questions to statements posted on his website. Chang 
근데 이제는 당연히 그렇게 되면 그건 과로사다. Kim Dong-hee was another delivery man who died in October last year. He didn't show up for work after texting a colleague saying he was just too tired. Colleagues later found him dead at his home. Police ruled heart failure as the cause of death. He was 36. Their parents and colleagues believe he was overworked. And some have been rallying outside Kupang's headquarters in Seoul. And because of the COVID-19 restrictions, there's a limit on the number of people allowed to gather. Kim Tae-hwan, who heads the union of delivery workers across the country, says they want to have their voices heard. 그 땀을 흘려서 일을 하면 정당한 대가를 받을 수 있어야 되고 이제 행복한 가정을 이룰 수 있는 조건이 돼야 되는데 여전히 이 택배를 비롯한 특히 이제 플랫폼 노동 새롭게 마, 만들어지는 데서 산업 질서가 제대로 안 잡혀 있고 그리고 어 근로 그 근로기준법을 적용을 받지 못하는 직업군들이 막 발생하면서 어 이들의 노동 조건은 굉장히 낙후해 있고 전 근대적으로 돼 있다고 볼수 있습니다. He says many workers are still left out in the cold despite President Moon Jae-in's pledge to ensure work-life balance for South Koreans when he slashed their maximum working hours to 52 hours from 68 in 2018. It's a sentiment shared by many South Koreans. Like this taxi driver who's been on the road for about 30 years now. <laughs> 거의 이제 밥 먹는 시간 빼놓으면 뭐한한 시간 정도 잡고 보통 뭐 가서 세차 어쩌고 하면 또 열두 시간은 보통 잡아야 돼. 교류 교대 시간이 있고 하니까. Taxi drivers are another group of people in South Korea who are often associated with overwork. The 70-year-old driver says taxis in South Korea work on two shifts a day. He used to work the afternoon and night shifts. But changed to the morning shift as the work pressure was getting too much. 일을 안할 수가 없고 그러다 보니까 막 항상 필요한 사람이 많죠. 이제 대개 보면 우리가 이제 하는 얘기로 저 얼굴이 색하면 죽는다 그런 얘기 많이 해. 이제 얼굴이 얼굴색이 변하니까 아무래도 필요하니까 그런 그런 게 많이 있어요. Like delivery workers, South Korea's taxi drivers barely have time to sit down for a proper meal. And that's why there are even restaurants specially catered for these drivers across the country. Kim young son who's been running this place for more than 30 years now, says the driver's restaurants called Kisa Shikdang are slightly different from other restaurants since the drivers need to be back behind the wheels fast. <laughs> President Moon wants to shed South Korea's reputation as one of Asia's most overworked countries by promoting work-life balance and workers' right to rest. But for millions of self-employed South Koreans who are overlooked by President Moon's new policy, their simple wish is that they don't become just another death by overwork statistics. India is one of the world's largest producers of waste and the numbers are staggering. 270 million tons of trash a year, that's enough to fill 13 million garbage trucks. And that amount is set to double by 2050 as India continues its rapid pace of urbanization and industrialization. The COVID-19 pandemic has added to this problem, leading to an increase in plastic waste. For 30 years, this is how Inder Kumar has begun his day. He goes from door to door, picking up trash from more than 250 houses in this residential complex in Delhi. In the past year, he's noticed there's been 40% more plastic waste. Inder believes it's due to the COVID-19 pandemic. There's been a surge in demand around the world for single-use protective gear, disposable food containers, even plastic packaging for online shopping. 
Big cities in India like Delhi, Mumbai and Bengaluru have seen a 47% jump in the amount of single-use plastic in the past year. Even before the pandemic, plastic waste was already a major problem. Indians generate more than 30 million tons of plastic waste every year, the weight of 3,000 Eiffel Towers. Only half is recycled and 40% remains uncollected, littering the environment. This plastic leaches into the groundwater and when it's burnt, pollutes the air. In 2019, Prime Minister Narendra Modi was expected to announce a complete nationwide ban on single-use plastic. But that ban was deferred following pressure from the plastic manufacturing industry amid concerns that a ban like this could hurt India's economy and lead to millions losing their jobs. Which is why single-use plastic, specifically the kind that's used for packaging, remains the biggest challenge for the country. The government says it will instead focus on phasing out single-use plastic by 2022, but there's no nationwide law regulating the use of plastic. Some states and cities have enforced limited bans. In Delhi, for example, the use of polythene bags was banned more than a decade ago, and last year the capital had plans to ban single-use plastic. But the pandemic has delayed that goal, and experts say that's a major setback. The, the wide variation in, in the list of products that states have banned uh, has meant that this ban is not successful. To say we have lost two years and, you know, India has committed internationally uh, to ban all single-use plastic by 2022. Individuals like Ripu Daman are helping to wage a war against plastic at the community level. For two years, he's observed a plastic fast, avoiding single-use plastic products. He encourages members of his plogging group to do the same. Most weekends, this group gets together to plog, where they jog and pick up litter at the same time. The first step is to not litter and then take the plastic of us, then your waste management comes. So if we, we go on to the third or the fourth step, people will not follow. And that's why we take the lowest hanging fruit. And the lowest hanging fruit is, when you bend down to pick up somebody else's litter, you will not litter again. That's, that's the most important thing. But there is still a vast amount of rubbish. 80% of waste that's collected ends up in landfills. Delhi is home to three big garbage dumps, but this is the most infamous. We're at one of India's largest landfills, and this is as big as 40 football pitches put together. The Ghazipur landfill reached its capacity nearly two decades ago, but despite that, 2,000 tons of waste is dumped here every single day. And this mountain of trash is a very graphic reminder of India's waste management problem. Spread over 28 hectares, last year this landfill grabbed international headlines with experts warning it was set to become taller than the iconic Taj Mahal. Under international scrutiny and after a huge outcry from locals, officials managed to reduce its height marginally this year. But they've done that by redirecting some garbage to low-lying areas of the landfill. For three million people who live a stone's throw away, the mountain of rubbish poses a constant threat. And that's why there was a fist spot there. If there was a fist spot there, it would come to all the dairy. It's so tight. If there's any disease, it's like a dengue. It's so tight. 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 Praveen Khandelwal is the chief engineer with the East Delhi Municipal Corporation and tasked with managing all of this waste. He says efforts are underway to divert some of the garbage to be used in making roads and by 2024, the landfill will be completely cleared. Experts argue this is an unrealistic target, but Mr. Khandelwal tells me it's possible. In 2016, I have a new SWM rule. वो अगर मेरा 100 परसेंट इम्प्लीमेंट हो जाएगा तो मेरा यहाँ पे बिल्कुल कूड़ा बंद हो जाएगा। Despite fines of up to 1300 US dollars, there's poor implementation of the mandatory segregation of waste and enforcement is lax. Waste collectors like Inder and his team still have to sort through the trash they pick up. होंगे सात आठ घर तो होंगे ये जो के मतलब ये जानते हैं जैसे मोदी की सकीम हुई है ये भी कुछ घर ऐसे अलग करके पनी उन डाल के दे दें कुछ घर जो है ना मतलब ऐसे ही दे दें हैं कोई ड्यूटी वाला है कोई परेशान है बेचारा किसी चीज़ दे ऐसे ही पकड़ा दें चलो मगर ठीक बाल्टियों में 
Lack of awareness is another problem. Civil society organizations like Chintan have stepped in to bridge this gap in some places. Two years ago, it teamed up with the Indian Institute of Technology in the national capital, home to 16,000 teachers and students. All of the waste generated here was sent to landfills every day. Now, IIT Delhi is close to being a zero-waste campus. A team of workers ensures more than 90% of the waste generated is diverted away from landfills. That's enough garbage to fill two jumbo jets. The dry waste is all the paper, cardboard, uh, metal, which all gets, uh, there are about 22 categories of resources which are segregated, so it no longer is thrown away in a landfill. The wet waste is then composted. So we have storage centers outside over here where the everything is segregated separately and uh, recyclers buy it. I mean, we have different recyclers for different products, so it's all sold at different rates. Beyond the IIT Delhi campus, Chintan also offers to pick up dry, recyclable waste from households free of charge. The NGO says the number of families requesting this service has doubled in the last few years. Experts say the waste management sector in India is pegged to grow at 7% every year and could be worth $14 billion in five years. But this potential is hugely underutilized. A majority of the recycling in the country is still done by informal scrap dealers and most recycling units are based in big cities. Siam Jen runs Thermo Waste Solutions, a recycling firm located on the outskirts of Delhi. 90% of the plastic waste it receives comes from scrap dealers. The firm also recycles plastic waste on behalf of 30 companies as part of India's extended producer responsibility policy. This means companies contract businesses like Thermo Waste to collect and process as much waste as their own products generate. But Sayam says for now only big firms are signing up. See, the thing is when we do uh, recycling responsibly, okay, so there are some added costs. And uh, whereas, I mean, you know, the unorganized sector they have, uh, I mean, their costing is less. And But the thing is that uh, it's not ensured that the plastic is being recycled properly or pollution free. So they do things in a, you know, less cost, I mean, they are more cost effective, but that is not environment friendly. So there is a kind of resistance in the uh, small and medium enterprises. But as India's economy grows, so too will its production of waste. Individuals, businesses and authorities will all have to chip in to deal with the scale of the problem.